All right. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. And if you can just give me one second, my screen. Um, all right, here we go. So I am calling to order the June 12th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly with the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, and I'm going to go through and do a sound check. Um, I do just want to say, and I know we are recording, but I, I'm in a lot of emotional pain. I'm dealing with a very difficult loss. And so I'm here showing up and I'm really happy to be here, but I just want to let you know that um, if, if, it, if I don't seem like my, my usual self, that's the reason. Um, so let me start with uh, Dr. Rhodes. I'm here and I can hear everyone and see everyone that's present, that is. Great. Okay. And Dr. Shabazz. I'm here and also um, in full solidarity and support of you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, and Hala. I'm here. I can hear you and similar to Dr. Shabazz. Sending love. Okay, thank you. And so I am going to ask if Jennifer will just take a moment, if she's still here, um, to just share a little bit, Jennifer, with us um, about the upcoming Juneteenth festivities. Um, and if anyone else has anything to share, because I know there's a lot going on that weekend. And I just want to um, just share that briefly, if you would. I just have to say first, I like that t-shirt, Dr. Shabazz. Very nice. Um, so there are a lot of things going on. And I think that we just created um, a listing of all the events that are that we are aware of that are going on for Juneteenth over the weekend and up until Monday the 19th. So on Saturday, the June 17th is the Ancestral Bridges uh history walk on sunday the amherst cinema is showing fences and then having a, a panel of fathers of black fathers i believe up to have a discussion on monday starting i believe at 10 a.m there's an event host, uh, featuring dr shirley whitaker over at the mill district and then followed at noon there's the jubilee on the common which will move to the middle school for assuming that if there's rain and then at 4 p.m the shabazz and um or the bb triple a will be hosting another uh jamboree at mill river at four Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Shabazz, do you want to say a word about the four o'clock event if you're involved in that? Well, yeah. Uh, also involving uh, Sankofa Gumbo, which is uh, the kind of Sankofa is the name in which we did a lot of um, Juneteenth uh, work going back to like 2011, 2012. And uh, so it just it's a West African proverb saying it is not uh, taboo to return and fetch it to go back and 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 get what you need to go forward. So um, uh, Sankofa continues, and uh, we'll we'll be out there till sundown. And folks are welcome to come, just uh, as you are. Bring your own chairs, tents, just you know, family style. It's just open and free. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And Jennifer, do you know when I should be the one to know this, but I don't? Do you know when the proclamation is being read in the, all of those? Uh, different events. Is that on at the town common? So, so uh, the only time that I know that the proclamation is being read is during the Jubilee, and that is on the common at noon, I think followed by the Amherst Gospel Choir, and then we have um, Taproots will be performing, and then after Taproots, we have Rebel will be performing, and then closing is Tem Bless. And so participation in the event is free it's on the town common there's no no fee to get in there is fee for if you want to buy something from the craft vendors as it is always support black businesses yeah 
Awesome. Okay. Thank you. That's great. That is really exciting. All of those wonderful events and thank you to everybody who's organizing them. them. Um, okay. So I'm going to start with the first period of public comment before we move into our work. Um, and so if you are in the audience and you would like to make a public comment, um, please use the raise hand feature. And I'll just quickly read the statement. I'm only going to read it once so that next time we have public comment, I will not read the statement again. Uh, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Uh, we will not engage in dialogue generally, um, but we will uh, certainly be listening and helpful as best we can. So if you would like to make a comment at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand. And again, there will be a second period of public comment later in the meeting. Okay, so I'm not seeing any. Um, so I wanted to give an update quickly on um, the legal questions that we had discussed at our last meeting. I did have a chance to connect with Paul. Paul has asked me to put those questions um, in writing for him after this meeting, and then he and the town's attorney will determine whether it's best to reply in writing or to visit us at a meeting. Um, or just to have a phone consultation. So I'll keep everyone posted on that. And I see that Dr. Rhodes's hand is raised. So I'm going to come to Dr. Rhodes. And yes, please, Dr. Rhodes. So today is June 12th. On June 12th of 1967, the Supreme Court uh, and the decision between, uh, uh, between Loving, Loving and the state of Virginia uh, made a ruling that it was uh, legal for uh, another person to marry uh, who of one color to marry a person of another color. Mm -hmm. And that was loving. So it's loving day. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's being been celebrated here in the United States and all over the actually in various parts of the world. This I think this is like the 57th anniversary of it. And I just wanted to mention that. So glad you did, Dr. Shabazz or Dr. Rhodes. Sorry, thank you. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, and really, yeah, that's such a significant um, time and day. Okay, so I was going to come to you, Dr. Rhodes, actually, uh, and ask if um, before we move into the meat of our work, last time we met, we talked about uh, you meeting with Sean about our fund. And I just wanted to ask if you had an opportunity to meet with him yet, or if that's still in process. I met with Sean uh, and uh, we had a good meeting. Uh, and then I followed up with Paul uh, that same day. And uh, the uh, net net of it is that we really can do whatever you want to do with this money that we have now and that which is coming. I.e., all we have to do is make a proposal, send it on to Paul, and Paul puts it before the council. Uh, so uh, you know we know in terms of how much is coming each year, we don't know what the, what that is, but any portion of that we can utilize during the year, the current year. In fact. Even now, uh, we can uh, say, hey, we would like to have X number of dollars go for a particular project or purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, my suggestion is that we, uh, on a going forward basis, say that we will take 30, 40% of whatever is available or 10, 15, whatever. But we make a decision on that. And my suggestion is that we do it for this year coming up. Uh, and uh, have a proposal. The only requirement is uh, that Sean says that uh, he would like to see, it's not necessarily something that has to be, is that the project no, not overlap with those projects already ongoing. And that was the only- Good afternoon, town manager's office. Jennifer speaking, how may I help you? Jennifer, you'll want to mute. <laughs> All right. So, and then Paul uh, agreed with that and said that, look, you know, 
the AHRA and any successor group can uh, request funding for that particular for a particular project for any amount of money that's available. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for having those discussions. And I just want to make sure that I clarify. So we're talking about a percentage of the two million and deciding amongst us uh, what percentage of that percentage would be uh, used now and in the future. So are you saying that Paul would need approval from the town council in order to allow us to use a percentage of the full two million now? No, um, well, well, yeah, we know what I'm saying is that Let's, uh, this is a hypothetical amount. Let's say that uh, um, that there's 200,000 in there now or 100,000 to come this year that hasn't been decided what, what the amount is going to be. But whatever is there, we can take a percentage of that for current purposes. In other words, we do not have to wait for the 2 million to be. We can utilize that which is already there or that which is going to, in other words, I don't know, again, uh, what, uh, whenever Paul uh, and Sean make a determination about what's going to be coming, going into the stabilization fund this year for, you know, uh, and uh, we can take a percentage of that, or we can take a percentage of that which is already there. Okay, I see. So maybe I misunderstood last week. I thought what we were trying to do, and maybe we still want to try to do this, is to um, proactively be able to take a percentage of 2 million net, like th that we, we could look to take, that we could look, if we're looking at it as an endowment, that that percentage would be off of the 2 million, not off of the, say, whatever is in there now, I think uh, maybe close to 500,000. Um, Dr. Shabazz, please. Yeah. I. Um... The way what I'm hearing, and and I know um, that was like one um, way I did hear it last discussion as well. But what I'm hearing, in from the feedback that um, Dr. Rhodes is bringing us, is that in a way the the, um, the fund will continue to accrue to the two million dollar goal, and. But in the meantime, there's nothing pre preventing some percentage of the fund that's accruing to two million to be used now, and that uh, or or for the coming years. So, if our recommendation, our our um, uh, document that we propose, that um, allocations begin in 2024. Um, you know, consistent with the successor group, vetting those projects, making sure those projects don't overlap with city, with town disbursements that are already going on. And then they made recommendations based upon a set amount, be it 100K, be it 50K, um, up to that amount for 2024, then that could be taken, let us say, out of the stabilization fund that's currently accruing accruing interest, but would uh, allow us allow the our successor group to get started with making allocations. And it just means that it's maybe a little different time frame of till until when we get to the two million, but um, but but we're we're still able to get started spending or the successor body would be able to to get started making some allocations is what I'm hearing. Right, and that's that's correct. You know, in other words, we really, let's say we said we wanted to do 30% of that, which is already there. That's $150,000 of the $500,000. We could allocate that for the, the upcoming fiscal year, which begins July 1, all right? In other words, this group right now could make a recommendation. Could make a recommendation. Correct. I got you. I got you. That's real. 
Okay, so not to uh, get too deeply into this right now, because we have a lot to do, but I just want to voice that the way that I had thought we envisioned the fund is that we would not take from the principal, we would take from what was accruing in interest, which is maybe, let's say, about 5%. So I had thought that very early on, you know, in the first two, three, four years, we would have very little to work with because we would be taking not from that principal. Um, we'd only be taking a percentage of the interest that's accruing off of a very low amount until it were to build up. So what I had thought is if we're if that's if that was sort of our uh, philosophy, then would we be able to have a formula that allows us to keep the principal in there, but calculate that, let's say, 5% interest on the 2 million, as opposed to on what is currently in the fund. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm, if that's making much sense, but that's how I had thought of it. Um, well, I, I, go ahead. I think, I, I think you're, you know, that's one way to look at it. But, you know, when, when you think of it, if we said, hey, we're going to assume that the two million is going to throw off five percent, and we want to take a, a percentage of that. All right. Yeah. So let's assume that uh, it's five percent of of two million dollars. Yes. That's a hundred thousand dollars. Exactly. So we can then say we want to take a percentage of that. Now, all right. Uh, and however, that it hasn't hasn't reached that, but you know so. Uh, you, you, we could we could very well do that. Now, it does not mean, by the way, just me, it does not mean that that which will be there when it gets two million will be the same. But that's mm -hmm. but those are calculations that could be made uh, by others. Uh, but what what I'm saying is that hey, if if it's two million dollars and we're saying five percent of that. Uh, and that uh, we're going to take a percentage of that 5% now. Exactly. We can do that with the understanding that on a going forward basis, uh, that is, uh, would be uh, something that would be debited in the future in terms of, the, we, could, we, we, could, we could do that. I mean, I, I might have to go through all of the machinations of, uh, and, the, and the arithmetic and all, all of that, but it, it's sound, uh, you know, be, uh, because, uh, you know, either way, we're able to spend that money now rather than waiting for it. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So um, maybe we can get more clarification on what that might look like. You said the math and also just, I want to make sure at least I, I, I'm wondering if this body wants to make sure that we're not drawing off of the principal and that the town is allowing us to essentially, it's almost like having a credit card. You know what I mean? Like they're allowing us to borrow now um, on the commitment that they made. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is um, the financial policy that I hope they will adopt based on the conversation that we had last week of turning their commitment um, into something uh, more permanent than the handshake that I believe we have right now um, from them. So, okay, good. Dr. Shabazz, you had your hand up. Did you? Oh, we can, we can proceed. Okay. So I'm going to pull up, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pull up what I have been working on um, as uh, an outline for our report. And it's a very, very rough draft and there are lots of holes and questions. Um, the one deliberative topic, when I went through the whole sort of skeleton of the how I th thought we might go forward with the report, um, we still did not deliberate on or discuss um, how we might, from our charge, um, develop ongoing other ongoing funding streams. Um, so that's something that when we get to that piece here in this uh, outline that we'll we're gonna talk about. So I thought we could go just let's see, am I not sharing? Huh? Okay. 
should be sharing now. Can everyone see this now? Yes. Good. Okay, great. Um, so, and this is, this is, like I said, this is just what came out of my brain. Um, I haven't sat yet with Mattia and of course we're just reviewing it now together. And so this can be completely revised. Um, but let me just take you through what I was thinking. So we have a report that's due, um, and we want people to read the report. Um, we want the important pieces to be up front. And then, of course, we want to fill in with all of the other pieces that one might reference as they're reading through our report and trying to make sense and understand our recommendations. So we begin with the committee charge, which I think is, um, you know, just obvious. Um, and then what I had thought is last week and I went back, Mattia transcribed our retreat, which was really helpful. And I went back and listened or read through our conversation and we talked about the difference between making sort of a broad analysis in our recommendations on how we think about the scope of reparative justice. And Dr. Shabazz talked about the concentric circles and he talked about um, the resident and identity, the, 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 three, the three ways that um, we might determine eligibility. And so I thought that we could start the report by having some visual and narrative representation of that broad analysis of our thinking. Um, I'm open if others feel, and these are the details, but I'm open to moving that to somewhere else in the report, but that's sort of how I envisioned it, is to come out really clearly um, up front and say, this is how we think about reparative justice. This is sort of our broad statement in terms of how we think about it. And then um, following that, we have first the recommendations for the town and the town council. Um, and this begins with asking them to adopt a charge for a successor committee, which we talked about last last time we met. And in my uh, recommendation, I would say we should include the full charge. So I started to fill in some of the pieces here and, and we'll come back to that. Um, but so th these are the pieces of a, a town a, a manager appointed charge and, and the things that we would want to be able to tell the town in terms of how they would adopt this uh, success, successor committee. Um, and so we have some questions that we need to answer here. Uh, and you'll see the top is sort of just like the nuts and bolts. And then there's the composition, which we need to uh, discuss. Uh, there's the purpose. Um, is that you, Dr. Sh Did you do that, Dr. Shabazz? Will you unmute? It, you're still muted. I just want to make sure there's not like a, a Zoom bomber in here. Was that you? That was me. And once I was in the pin mode, I couldn't get back to unmute myself. But uh, yeah, that was that was me. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. And then here we go into what is the actual charge? So last time we talked about uh, the committee soliciting and vetting applications or interest from the community. We talked about a biannual Black Town meeting, which was Dr. Shabazz's uh, recommendation, which I think was really excellent. This would be open to all Black Amherst residents, as I understood his vision. Um, and then having an application calendar similar to the community preservation where there would be an information session and an application round window on an annual basis. Um, and so this committee would also then recommend initiatives to the town council. Um, the question is out there about whether it would be annual or biannual. Um, this committee would also be the keeper of the fund. Um, so they would deal with the fund, oversee the fund, manage the fund, all of that kind of stuff, make sure that the money is getting allocated into the fund on an annual basis. Um, and then they would also, I added here, review and update the Amherst Reparations Allocation Plan every three years. And that can be changed every year, every two years, every five years. But I think this body needs to keep its uh, awareness on that because things may change in the town and as our, our initiatives are moving forward. 
Um, and then the second recommendation is to adopt uh, the reparations fund policy, which again uh, makes um, more permanent the agreement that we have with the town on the $2 million. Uh, we have a question out about whether we want the town to seek special legislation. Uh, we have truth and reconciliation initiatives, and do we want DEI to uh, be sort of the lodestar for those initiatives and, and what might that look like? Um, and then there are other recommendations that we may want to make. Um, Jennifer had brought up the solar last time. Uh, there might be townwide educational programs like the stolen beam that we asked the town to um, implement. Uh, there are recommendations potentially for the schools as well. Um, and then other recommendations, and these were more specific recommendations. And what I'm going to ask is that in our next meeting, um, those of us who have specific recommendations we want to bring forward, like Mr. Driver, like the Coleman family, like anything else, um, that we bring those forward at our next meeting and we debate them and uh, we vote on them as necessary. Um, so these are our more narrowly tailored. They do not go necessarily to the town or to the town council, um, but they're recommendations that we want to make. Um, and so that's sort of like the highlights then you of our recommendations. Then you, of course, need in this report to talk about the AHRA's process. So our legislative actions, our community actions, um, our committee actions, people are going to want to know how many times did we meet, um, how many listening sessions, who did those listening sessions include, um, all of those kinds of things. The survey results, of course, we will want to include. Um, the Dunahue Institute has provided us uh, some really excellent visuals and other ways that we can provide um, sort of a higher level look at the survey results. And then we will probably also have an appendix, we'll have a bunch of appendices and one of them will include the full raw results. Um, we'll also have our listening session feedback and then any other reports, links, et cetera. Um, I did also want to point out up here under the other recommendations that I did put federal. Um, that's something that we do need to talk about if we want to make any suggestions or recommendations. And maybe that really goes to the town council if there's anything that we would be asking for them to do. So I'm going to pause um, and just open the floor um, specifically around this structure and whether this seems like it's in good order, it needs to be changed up. And yes, I see your hand, Dr. Shabazz, please. Yeah, I might need to think about, um, I wanna think a little more about the ordering here. Um, I certainly think a, uh, a reflection of our charge uh, would, would come up front. Um, Generally, these things do kind of proceed with all of the sort of history uh, of the creation of the group and of the different actions taken by the group. I do agree from readability that um, that that I see in your approach, you were going to put more of that that history of what this body, the AHRA, has done. You see it more. Uh, down toward the end of the document rather than up front. A lot of times it is up front and it does sort of bury the lead, so to speak. But um, but I think that it's something I still want to want to think about a little bit more because um, it does seem like beyond the question of the charge, the 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 group who is making the recommendations is is also important to 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 state. So there's the charge. There's there could then be a listing of the uh, of the members uh, of the body, uh, including our you know pre previous member and and co chair um, that when we started out um, and um, the uh, you know but just reflecting who is actually. Um, authoring this report, uh, as well as those that that have assisted. Uh, uh, of course, more of that can be expanded in the in the appendix or acknowledgments or thanks somewhere somewhere down the line. But uh, 
But again, I'm just still thinking about, again, making sure that it's readable, that you don't bury the lead, that you do get into the important things that the the body that we're this report is reporting to uh, really wants to know and uh, flowing from the charge itself. And so that brings me to this point, and that is to, it, it, things have been brought up before about the tone of the document, the voice of the document, and also, um, which to me is also then brings the question of the audience. Um, and it seems to me, you, you were talking about in some matters, these are things we're saying to the council. It seems to me everything we're saying here is to the council and town manager as the entity that 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 um, charged us and created us. Uh, I think there is the larger uh, way in which we are speaking to the general public, the general public of the town of Amherst, the general public uh, beyond the town of Amherst that that may be interested in what in our work. But it does seem to me that. We, if we think about that, the audience, then then basically everything we're we're reporting, uh, all of the broad rationale uh, and and broad uh, view of what reparations is and what reparative justice should mean in this town is all, in some ways, addressed to to the council and to the um, uh, town manager. Now, it, it it occurs to me that we ought to specifically. Uh, think about within the report what are specific recommendations we're asking the uh, the council to approve, to actually vote and to actually take action on based upon our report, and uh, and again how to um, you know maybe bracket that out right up front and and then you know get more into the discussion of them and uh, later on in the document, but it does seem we ought to really identify specific action items that uh, voting items that we are recommending to to the council, such as the the successor body, um, such as its 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 ongoing work and charge and um, such as the uh, the reparations fund uh, policy, um, and you know these are these are ones that that we you know and again and, and on down the list, but um, but definitely uh, the even as we explain and whatnot, somewhere to just sort of identify all of the specific things we're recommending that that action be taken on, um, just somehow be be in bold or be bracketed somewhere so that they're so that we can know that 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 we've been clear to them of the specific things we ought to recommend. And let me say on number two, the reparations fund policy, I um I don't know what all is uh envisioned there, um, but two things come to mind to me. And one is that, you know, the it, it, we ought to revisit the framework of the of creating the two million dollar fund. Um, it was initially based on the the shadowing of this of, of of looking at this new revenue source that, in the discussion of things, we later found there wasn't support from certain members of the council or the, certainly the president of the council to. Uh, to do earmarks, uh, but uh, so we ended up somewhere in this compromise position of we'll sort of look at what is coming in through this revenue source and then try to take that amount in free cash. You know, if um, if there's real support for the creation of the $2 million fund, then I don't think we ought to restrict it anymore to what has come in through through cannabis. Uh, uh, tax revenue. If they support it, then they could vote a larger percentage of free cash based upon getting to the goal of establishing this $2 million fund that we can then begin to operate from straight up and not have to, you know, to, to, to worry about 
you know, when is it going to be complete and, and when can we start spending versus not spending the principal or, or this, that. Let, you know, I think we ought to discuss recommending that, um, you know, understanding the, all of the capital projects and, 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 and the, the, the revenues of the town, but um, if there's commitment to this going forward, then we recommend going ahead and establishing uh, the, the $2 million fund is uh, as quickly as possible that it is an ongoing um, set aside amount that from which we can then spend, spend the, the, uh, uh, the interest per year. I'll stop there for now. I just, I really want to support that, that it's, uh, Dr. Shabazz, that it's not tied to cannabis and that um, the policy would be explicit about that. Because I think when we, when, when we ask for this commitment, we were in a way, we were in a different place in terms of our community and um, in terms of our understanding about reparative justice and in terms of our ability to sort of, um, embrace this initiative. And I do feel that we've deepened our commitment um, as a community and as a town and a town council. Um, and I have seen that very clearly come through, um, through the budget process, through things that Sean has put out there that um, while right now we don't have anything in writing, really, um, I do see that the commitment has deepened. And so I think that we can um, we can get that really nicely worked into a policy. Um, and I think there was concern from the council and from the finance department about it being tied to that source as well. Uh, Dr. Rhodes. Um, you know, and Dr. Shabazz, uh, you know, I think that one area not area, but one way that we can do this, and I have to, I think we need to check this out. We could uh, become another enterprise fund uh, of the town and that each year X amount of dollars goes into that enterprise fund. The enterprise fund would be reparations fund um, that would build up uh, to the two million. However, the appropriation is something that would be ongoing every year. It would be a permanent part of the budget. Uh, and and as, as, as an enter enterprise fund, uh, no, no different than the enterprise funds for water and sewer for you know, whatever, there are a number of enterprise funds. We could become and suggest that we become a separate enterprise fund that's permanently there. It, if we can get a little more info for the rest of our members and for all of us to kind of, you know, understand what the implications of that are, that that might be good for people not here today. I would say as well, one thing to, um, you know, with, with with respect of it is, and 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 uh, with respect of the the policy is also the question of rollover. So let's say in a given year, the successor group did not get um or, or in the applications that it vetted it didn't say spend an entirety of 50,000 or whatever the kind of percentage you know being worked from then if you could roll that over then in the subsequent year maybe they could spend 75 or or or, or what have you but but those are the little details of course we could kind of uh get educated on and and the enterprise idea get educated on and then um you know begin to to uh uh, seek clarity for the successor body to know here is here are the availability of funds and here's what you can you can accept applications and 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 begin to look at allocation. I I, I agree. Yeah, and I think that um, it's oh Jennifer, yes, please go ahead. Well, I mean, I just have questions or thoughts, so. Uh, why don't how just how come why don't we have a war has anybody thought of the concept and I thought we talked about this last meeting I'm not sure is if we moved in the same terms as like you know 
the friends or how the friends of the Jones as opposed to being completely attached to the town. I don't know like how that plays out or not with this, but then it would eliminate, but they still have to commit. Like they still have to continue with that commitment or to completely like use uh, something similar to BAM, like where it's just, it's not associated with the town, but still funded by the town. And that's their like commitment to us is to, to give us that money. And that's their reparations by giving us that money. But then there's another group that oversees it. But so I don't know if it loses like control. I don't know if there's control involved in it or not, but it would make thing, some things much easier, I would think. And perhaps it makes other things much harder. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think those are good questions. Uh, what I was going to say is the enterprise fund was thought about. And as I recall, um, there are certain state regulations that an enterprise fund must comply with. And I think that Sean thought um, that doing using the um, stabilization fund would be more flexible. So what I'm proposing, if this group is comfortable with this, is that Irv and I would set up a meeting with Sean to discuss what our possibilities are for getting this financial policy in place, including the use of uh, a percentage off the full two million and what that might look like and all of those questions that have been raised. Um, Dr. Rhodes, would that be something that you would work with me on in the next week or so that we could try to set up with Sean? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be good to have Sean's input on this. I mean, and, and because, you know, it's a, when I think about it, you know, you're, if we're going to use funds now off of a, off of a future uh, uh, assumption of $2 million and we're going to take assume that it's going to be 5%, and we're going to take a percentage of that 5%. How then does that affect the amount going forward in terms of it accumulating over that period of time? Now, now you know, and, and you know, those are financial calculations that are, e that are easy to do. Uh, and, and, um, and, and what that would mean over time. But it's, you know, they're, they're just financial ca calculations. That's all. Awesome. Yes, Dr. Shabazz, did you want to? So, more specifically to, to Jennifer Moiston's question, and I think it's a very important one, and, and um, I, I want to uh, uh, just speak from, mention from the experience of BAM, because this also came up very early on. And, and here's part of the, part of the dilemma. Um, so the, here is the community that has experienced the harm and then we're saying okay do we do we go and tax ourselves to create a nonprofit foundation instrument that can receive private donations and can receive public donations uh, that is to say, disbursements from the town, like Jones Library does, as a private, as a as a private nonprofit. Uh, do we go ahead and take the risk, and and potentially spending, you know, thousands of dollars of of time with an accountant, uh, with lawyers, with going to the the treasury, you know, applying under the the state and federal guidelines, and all with the with the hope and with the um, you know, the risk that down the line we'll get to a place then where you know the private sector, the faith interfaith community, and the town might ultimately then say yes and we'll work with this body and we'll support this body and we'll put funds behind this body that would on the one hand if it worked out similar to the jones that would then put the the control entirely in the hands of that nonprofit uh uh entity arising from the black community and and being made up of members of the black community but then it is, uh, it is the, again, how do we get there? 
And 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 uh, I think as you pointed out, Michelle, a lot we've seen a lot evolve over these past nearly two years. And so these are things we can certainly take to the black community and and revisit with them the idea of creating a a stakeholders uh, group uh, uh, within the black community and and then from there. But but I have to just say, at least from my vantage point in the early discussions within BAM, it was like, yep, yeah, that that's is a sound way to go. But what are we talking about then? We're we're saying we tax ourselves to go and create this entity and take the risk that you know everybody's gonna gonna come in support of it and and uh, and invest uh, put put reparations dollars into it. I don't know. And I just, uh, well, I don't understand. Well, first I would say that why couldn't the town help us? Like, that's the whole point, right? Like, wow. right? Like, wh I don't, and then also, I don't know at the end of the game to what you just, the last part of what you just said, how is that really any different from the town? Like half of the community is going to support us and half the other community is not, regardless of what way we flow or don't flow. But I, in, and again, there are just possibilities, right? So and I think that the more ways that you have to look at the way that we move forward, the more ways you can kind of narrow down what is the correct way, as opposed to five years and being like, well, why didn't we think of this? I, so Michelle sits on top of more expertise about this than I really have. She she talked with folks, particularly uh, as that that set up, uh, you know, private um, community foundations in Evanston. She's she, you know, I mean we have a lot of we have some things to go on in terms of how this can be done i just am giving a little bit of the background that two two years ago when hala and irv and myself and some of the other current and and, and uh previous black elected officials got together with other black community members this was one of the the kind of sticking points in terms of okay just going out there setting up a a private black stakeholders you know community kind of foundation and uh but yes if this could proceed as part of the report asking uh the council and asking the manager to uh to work and to support and to signal the support for a private black stakeholders group then then i think that's that's absolutely um another way to go in a way that could let me say one final thing on this that could uh make unnecessary seeking the special legislation from the state. Because if we can create the the conduit, uh, like a Jones Library, that you know is acting in the public interest, uh, that is under that, but but you know, also represents a specific set of stakeholders within the Amherst community that is the black uh uh, uh, uh descendants of slavery uh in Amherst then absolutely that could be a way that could render the the whole special legislation route unnecessary if we set it up legally and properly and correctly. What do you say, and, Irv? Oh. I'm sorry. I just... I, here's, when I think about it, I, I keep looking at all the models are available here in town, Jones Library being one of them that receives uh, town funds. Uh, and that's a nonprofit. The other one is the uh, the bid. The bid receives town funds, uh, you know, in any number of different ways, uh, and uh, and has has done that over the years. Uh, the I think the the important question is, what is the time frame that it's going to take to set up this entity? Uh, that's either a five hundred one. C3, or it could be one that's like the bid, which is not a 501C3, but something similar to that, uh, in which uh, funds from the town can be directed. Those are the kinds of things I think Michelle was getting at that her and I would then sit down, would sit down with Sean and go over all the possibilities and land up on one that would, uh, would allow us to meet our objectives. And what I hear the objective is, is to have a separate uh, group, separate entity.
that's separate from the town that the town puts money into on a regular basis. And that separate entity is controlled by members of the black community. You know, so yeah, I, I think that um, that would be a really good conversation to have with Sean. Yeah, and it I don't well it just seems interesting that we would have a it's gonna sound kind of crazy. Sometimes I don't like when things are recorded, but to have a black to have reparations that has to go through this approval process of people who aren't in within the black community, right? Like I don't I don't know, right? It seems like that the whole decision should I mean, I guess there should be some work in it, but I think looking at it from the pub from the black community as a whole for those folks to be and I don't know what time I'm sorry, I'm kind of I'm super tired from yesterday. So I don't know if I'm making any sense. So I apologize. But I also I like I don't know what kind of time frame rush we're in if the money at this point is just collecting and we don't really have a full picture of how we want to help people other than maybe a handful of people to know that spending the time to do that is wrong or right necessarily like I don't have an idea of what our time frame is on anything either so do we have a time frame here here's my suggestion based on um collecting these thoughts I think that it is absolutely true that if a 501c3 or similar organization was created, um, it would mean that uh, it that having special legislation would not be necessary. My suggestion, or could mean, my suggestion is that this would be part of a charge for the successor body. I do not think that we have the time, resources, capacity, or even that we're grounded enough in this at this point um, that we would be the body to do this. I think more study needs to happen. I have a lot of notes from speaking with the Evanston Community Foundation and the way that they went about it. And I'm not saying this needs to be a drawn out process, but if this is one of the main issues that the successor body would ch be charged with, right when they hit the ground running, um, then I think that uh, the, that that would be an, an excellent, uh, an excellent uh, item for them to work on. And so, but to Dr. Rose's point, I think we can absolutely talk to Sean about how we can lay that up for the next group. And we can talk to Sean and the town attorney about what would be needed to make that recommendation. So for example, if we're going to include this as a part of the next body's charge, then Maybe we're not making a recommendation for special legislation at this time, but we're saying that that recommendation could be tied to whether this 501c3 comes together or not. Um, and so that's that's my thinking. I think if we try to get into the weeds of trying to figure out how to set that up right now without, you know, this Blacktown meeting that Dr. Shabazz uh, came up with here, I mean, to me is just, it's so critical because there's still so much information from the black community that we don't have. And, you know, I think we need to take the time to get that information and just set up the way that that can happen. Um, so I agree, but this, this is good, good discussion. I think it's, I I'm seeing some answers evolving if we, if we're all in agreement and, you know, particularly in relation to the to the special legislation, because I have to say, as someone who who was into that question and brought it up kind of early on, you know, as I looked at it, as I heard from legislators that I talked to afterwards, they, their immediate thing is, um, you know, well, if you do it for one town, why not do it for all? And so it got moved to a broader statewide question. We know there are multiple uh, uh, bills regarding reparations currently pending in the legislature, um, um, Miranda's and others. So I think this is this is maybe a better course for us to take than to really, you know, uh, hinge a, a strong recommendation on the question of special purposes, which to refresh ourselves is really just about how can you um, establish that it is a compelling um, 
you know, state interests, local governmental interests to do something with, you know, disperse public funds to a specific group or a specific per project or person that um, is not is not allowable. So uh, without it being declared as such a special purpose. So uh, I, I think this this could be then a good way to go, uh, just as you say, Michelle, setting these points up, allowing the successor group to have to 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 begin to work on the specifics of how to set up, uh, uh, how to foster a uh, a type of community trust or foundation that could relate to the the Black Town meeting and so on. I think this is. This, this, these are good suggestions regarding our financial policy and regarding uh, uh, aspects of the, the future work of the successor body. Excellent. All right, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Spaz. And I, I just sort of along that line to continue, do we want to think about today um a, additional or ongoing funding streams do we do does anybody have ideas i think we just lost hollow which means um i'm going to stop the share because i'm yeah we're out of quorum yeah we're out of quorum so i know that this has happened with hollow's uh connection previously so it might just be a connection issue oh there we go <laughs> it is <laughs> hollow can you hear us we just lost you for a moment I can. I apologize for that. Can you hear okay. me? Absolutely. No worries. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, and that's another question that when Irv and I meet with Sean, we can explore with him because he is really quite a creative um, person and um, has had a lot of really good ideas. He, I think, would love to see us and the town and the finance department would love to see us have other um, funding streams available to us. And so like, for example, I think I mentioned last week, one recommendation I do think we should make is that the within the legal uh, ability for the town to do so, um, that some percentage of CPA funds, whether it be open space or historic preservation or affordable housing in any one of those areas, that it be designated um, for residents who identify as Black and who bring those forward, those applications forward. So that's a question I have for the legal counsel um, that will be going to Paul today. So we'll be able to get a little bit of a better understanding if we can actually even make a recommendation like that. But that would be an automatic funding stream for us, another funding stream for us, if, if that were the case. Or maybe not a funding stream, but a way to get reparation benefits made from another source. Um, no, Along sorry. the lines, yeah. I can say one thing is, is that I am preparing to, to send to you, to some of you all, consistent with some of my statement over the past uh, almost couple of years around um, peoplehood and around public memory as part of peoplehood and part of repairing the damage to the, to, to uh, Black folks' sense of peoplehood, um, that uh, we look at a kind of public memory project, um, and and I have a number of, of of different areas to to recommend and to highlight. Um, I have ideas about that that are similar to the the stumble stones in Germany of ways in which certain kinds of markers could be established, and but I have to say part of it for me becomes the question of to what extent would does it actually fit the historic preservation component of community preservation? Because in my mind or in your mind, we might read it as such, but then relative to the history of how CPA has operated relative to how, you know, what its statutory sort of, uh, of language is, they may not see it as such. Um, and that and, and and then I also have questions about, you know, the the actual ex some experiences that I will have 
uh, Hala will will perhaps can back what I'm saying and, and provide greater clarification. But for example, Goodwin Memorial received CPA funds, but then it came out after a period of time and nothing had begun in terms of the work to repair the electrical system and to deal with saving the, the, little, the, the little church that it seemed as though they were, uh, the sense was you pay for it first, you get all the work done, make sure it's all done up to code and, and correct, and then submit to us your receipt and we reimburse you. And it was like, well, if we need it, you know, if we if we applying to you for help, it's because we don't have the funds to go and do it like that. Can you partner and help us now to find the right people to do the work up to code and to get it done uh, properly and you pay the bill, you know, out of the funds you're awarding us? Now, I think ultimately that did get get resolved, but it was a it was a serious impasse at one point, and that's something we'll have we'd want to to be clear on as we make such recommendations to CPA um, that 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 the uh, that that perhaps they're ready to to revisit some of their ways in, in which they've worked with black folks and with black organizations and with black history in the past to think about a, a different practice uh, going forward with respect to, to reparative justice proposals, we or the successor group may send over. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, Dr. Shabazz, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, do you see the peoplehood and public memory and things like street naming and um, and all of those kinds of things? Because, for example, um, there was a gentleman who passed away recently, a beloved gentleman in the community, maybe Mr. Brooks. Is that a name? Uh, I think, Dr. Shabazz, you were connected to this person, um, but somebody that is a neighbor to this person. Dr. Dr. Brace. On Bracey. 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 Thank you so yeah. much. Yes, thank you. Yes, exactly. Dr. Bracey, um, it was suggested to the town that uh, there'd be a name, a street named after Dr. Bracey. Um, and Paul said, sort of came back to me and said, I'm assuming that the AHRA is going to make some recommendations about putting a policy forward to do that. And so it just like, do you see that as fitting in under like truth and reconciliation recommendations or where do you, is that its own separate category? That's what I was just trying to pull up on the, um, on right. the skeleton here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I um, really think that relative to our charge it, 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 of where you have other recommendations, these are sort of specific current recommendations that our body is making. And, um, and I would see these as uh, um, and, and, and I'm hearing the word policy from you. And if that's the case, then uh, I guess we need to, to explore what that is and think that that kind of piece out. You know, when I hear about street renaming, I um, and I've been through this. I first went through it in the early 80s uh, in Harlem when we worked to rename Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard. And I had to learn the 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 procedure in New York City, which was quite complicated. You had to go through the borough of Manhattan, since Harlem is in the borough of Manhattan. You had to go through that governmental part of the governmental structure. They then had different subcommittees you had to go through to to uh, to raise the question of the street renaming. That it had to then those committees had to report back and and uh, to the borough body and then the borough body had to then take a vote and it was david dinkins at the time was the head of the the borough of manhattan and then and and then from dinkins you know they they passed on a recommendation to the larger um you know assembly new york assembly to to vote and and then mayor ed koch was a mayor at the time and it ultimately got to him and he was quite ready to sign it he was very supportive of it and the and of the shabazz family and renaming lennox avenue for malcolm x boulevard as it as interestingly as it turns out 
he was quite supportive. So it was, um, but, but, you know, here I hear about the process so you got to find out if, what the fire department thinks and you got to find out what the police thinks, because if they got to make emergency calls and there's going to be confusion of the name now or of is it is it still, you know, Main Street or is it Martin Luther King Boulevard and and is it going to throw people off and then it's got to go here and it's got to go there and then it comes out to the manager to to recommend to the council. I mean, I don't really know the policy here. But if you're asking me to think through a policy, it would be we give you the name and you go change it. So so that, that's about as, as complicated as it is to be. But, um, <laughs> Jennifer, what do you think of that? <laughs> um, yeah. I'm just joking. That's really funny. Actually. Um, yeah. And well, so I don't I don't believe that we have a policy and I believe that's what Paul was so like we we for example might recommend that the town develop a street naming policy and that uh or and building street and building or or place policy that um then would be the uh sort of um way that the that that the successor body if they want to change the name of the street for Dr. Bracy for example would be able to then use that street naming policy i don't know how much control we want to have over the policy itself but i think what we do want is to at least have the council adopt um the recommendation to create a policy um, that is in consultation with the successor body of the AHRA, for example. Um, so I, this is what I'm going to suggest for now. I'm going to send everybody the outline that we were working with today um, and ask that you um, provide any feedback on that outline to um, myself and Jennifer only, please. And then we'll, Mattia has been here the whole meeting. Um, she'll also, I'll be hopefully meeting with her this week. In addition to that, I'll be meeting with uh, hopefully Sean and Irv and legal counsel will be working on these questions that we have. So we have a lot going on. Dr. Shabazz talked about um, some recommendations he has to bring forward. At our next meeting, uh, meeting I'm going to ask that any recommendations that would fall in the category um, down here um, in terms of other recommendations like Mr. Driver, um, Professor Driver, the Coleman family, anything to the Chamber Bib faith organizations or uh, federal or otherwise, that you come prepared to the next meeting with um, and if you don't, don't worry about having to have written the motion, we can do that, or you can email or call me and I can help create a motion, but that we would at least have that to put forward to deliberate on. Let me ask you one other thing. Sure. Um, bid chamber faith organizations. Uh, uh, I can certainly write up a, a federal one endorsing the creation of a commission to study and recommend uh, proposals at the federal level. Um, and uh, I, I'll try to, to get that language prepared for us to look at it. On the faith or a faith interfaith piece, you know, we do have the, the sort of standing question of the, um, the stolen beam uh, curriculum. And I don't know if we're talking about whether a, an endorsement statement for faith groups to to uh, uh, to look at that or uh, and to perhaps replicate or model creating it in there as as we say an endorsement uh, we might give and, and recommend the council to to also endorse um, I think you know with respect to the school curriculum um, it it would be really in and in one of our areas of the schools which we haven't had a chance to do quite as much, but with the meeting with POKU, I do think about how um, we may want to recommend or endorse some type of, um, of recommendations curriculum uh, consistent with social studies objectives, 
uh, you know, there is this whole civic engagement um, uh, piece that was voted a few years ago at the state level that requires civic uh, engagement projects. Maybe uh, there's a way um, we can look at language and I'll reach out to some people to maybe some teachers I know to perhaps help me think about how and maybe Irv, if you could think about anybody in the district that could help us to uh, craft a statement in um, asking the, uh, again, in our report, endorsing some form of uh, uh, of creation under perhaps under the civics aspect of a unit on reparations, reparative justice, um, you know, and, and again, it, it doesn't have to be exclusively even to black reparations. It's something that could take into account some education around Japanese American reparations for the internment uh, uh, in World War II. It could take in Native American issues of reparations. It could take take into account the uh, uh, Holocaust and the uh, uh, reparations, you know, uh, in that context. But to really find a way to create some language supporting reparations and reparative justice in the curriculum, uh, in the social studies curriculum at the middle and high school level, certainly. Um, and then also the uh, uh, the um, I'm trying to ref there was something on the screen in my mind I'm going back to, but um, the Well, I'll just leave it at that, that those are some some areas that we can um, certainly come back to to discussion on. Um, and uh, it's OK, Michelle. And you sure. <laughs> OK. okay. Those are some of them. Are you there? Oh, well, it was it was the other organization wise. So that was the faith component is. I think about the JCA and the stolen bean crickle, but in terms of other organizations at the event um, Jennifer was referring to and my t-shirt refers to, um, I talked with folks involved with the League of uh, uh, Women Voters and the league has, you know, flowing from engagement with, with us, with AHRA and with these issues have now um, gotten it adopted to uh, within Massachusetts to look at creating reparations as a policy area within the league. And this is a big deal because as it um, moves forward and if uh, as it's approved as a area of policy concern, then league units all throughout this, this, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts can proceed to do work around political um, work, education work around reparations. And then likewise, that could even lead to the development of a national policy within the league um, uh, that, that, that could then be on its list of, of, of areas. So um, that is one that I don't know if, again, there's something we might want to, to craft in the report or acknowledge in the report or endorse within the report, but that is one that uh, just came to me yesterday. Oh, and then finally bid chamber. I'm still not, you know, that was one that was signaled to kind of look at maybe what things they're doing and and uh, and what things, you know, other folks are doing that could be of relevance. Um, I'm still kind of opening to open to hearing, you know, more if anybody has any context around it. I do know from, um, you know, that the question of, uh, of, of African-American um, business development, econ uh, enterprise development, that is certainly an area of uh, right for reparative work. And, um, uh, and so uh, I will keep a, keep a mind on, on that one as well. But I just did want to bring that, mention that the, the league piece as, uh, as well. I'm so glad you did. I received an email about that yesterday, and um, that is a really, really great uh, um, progress. And just I, I was excited to hear about that. And I also think it's important that folks get involved with that organization in particular because um, who who 
Black folks in particular who are interested to make sure that the policy that the league recommends um, inclu is inclusive of different viewpoints um, and, and things like that. Um, but that is that's super exciting and also added the BB triple A to the um, list there with the bid in the chamber. OK, excellent. So we do have to um, call or we we are going to call our second um, public comment period and just have to do that before we would lose a quorum. So I'm going to open that up right now. Um, oops. <laughs> Hold on, Dr. Shabazz. <laughs> Where'd you go? Um, do we need, I'm trying to think, we can't take any actions without a quorum, but I think we can call public comment without one. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm not going to read there. There he's back. I thought he'd come back. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and call our second period of public comment. And um, as I said earlier, I'm not going to read the full statement again, but if you do, if you do have a public comment, please use the raise hand function. Jennifer, we do have a phone number. Can you remind that person how they might raise their hand? Is it star nine, pound nine, star nine? Star nine. Okay, so um, if the person who's coming in on the phone number would like to make a public comment, just use the star nine function. And anyone else who would like to make a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, I see Dr. Shabazz's hand right now. So while folks are deciding, please go ahead, Dr. Shabazz. One other group that has come to mind met with us quite a bit early on, and that's the land trust and so the very the question of of home ownership and affordable housing a way in which to specifically highlight within our report uh the uh the the goal the idea of how the uh, afro descendants of slavery uh in amherst can be prioritized or can be um uh acknowledged within the various projects that are going on in Amherst around uh, affordable housing, home ownership, uh, 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 houselessness that could specifically take a reparative justice approach as part of their work. I know there are places, I know there are people donating homes to, to their, their homes, hoping that it can be used toward uh, affordable housing for families. How do we make that part of the scope of reparative justice as well to to support those actions but to also specifically find ways to to direct it in an angle in a in a toward um afro descendants of 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 slavery uh um that that's something else i wanted to to put out there as to in our in our um in our whiteboard uh that that we're listing things out in can yes. i just just added that, Dr. Shabazz. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, Jennifer. Can I just add quickly that after, you know, the nice thing about yesterday, there was um, a lot of folks out at the courts and a lot of folks in general, but one of the topics that came up the most regarding reparations or any kind of restorative justice was affordable housing from Section 8 all the way to home ownership. So I would say that is definitely one of the main concerns. <laughs> Were you finished, Jennifer? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was coughed while you were talking. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and thank you for for recalling the the land trust and they and they did. They came to several of our meetings and they're doing that work and there are other people doing that work. So Okay, great. So I don't see any hands. I didn't actually close the public comment period. I'm going to close it now because I did not see any hands go up. Um, so, uh, but thank you to those who attended. Um, so is next Monday um, <clears throat> is not a date that we can meet. It's Juneteenth and uh, we'll be meeting in all sorts of other ways. And so I would like to make sure, though, that we do meet again next week. Um, would it work for folks if I do what I normally do, which is just send out some ideas um, in an email and then see where we get? Does that work? Okay. 
So I'm going to do that. And are there any other comments or, or committee reports or anything else before we um, adjourn the meeting? We're out of quorum, so I'm, I'll just say we can even stop the recording if you want. But oh, no, we're still in quorum. I'm sorry. Um, but the I, I'm wondering, how do we also specifically and, and where within the outline we're developing specifically highlight and endorse in some way the work of ancestral bridges? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a group. This is not only I mean, this is like really at the center of our most of our concentric circles in mm. terms of a um, uh, people, black folks in Amherst who are descendants of, uh, of, of, of the enslaved here in the United States, in Massachusetts, and, and in some cases even here, right here in Amherst. How do we specifically find a way to endorse, to support the, um, uh, the the member the remembering the rememberization as Tony Morrison would say or the remembering of the the, the families like uh, the Bridges the Bias the the Jacksons the you know on and on those 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 families uh, in some ways we might call the first families of Amherst in the sense of uh, of of black folks who you know developed surnames who came out of who came out of slavery and 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 uh created surnames and actually became a part of the citizenry as as full full human beings uh coming out of shadow slavery how, how do we do that where do we do that yeah uh, uh, yeah hey dr Rhodes. so that's you know that is a specific kind of group that we can have a way of using some of our funds to uh, have ongoing support for. And we could, you know, ask them to put forward proposals uh, that we could, or a successor group could act upon in terms of supporting them on an ongoing basis. Michelle, will you do that as our as our chair to ask, particularly our member Ms. Bridges? You know that now now's the time to show and prove. You you I can remember from her first meeting that she got on it to to look out for her ancestors. So okay. now's yep. the time. Show and prove. What 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 are your ancestors telling us we need to do? And Absolutely, yeah. I recommend it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll talk to both Ms. Bridges and um, Anika and and see what their their thoughts and wishes would be on that. And um, and then um, maybe Ms. Bridges in our next meeting will be able to even talk more about it in the meeting. But yeah, I'll do that. If you need any others for backup, uh, you know, feel free. There's there's Holla there, me, Irv. Um, but you know, definitely, I think formally from AHRA, I hope. Uh, we, I'd like to get their their input to to this final report as to what what would constitute a um, you know a reparative because they you know the damage in their case is they were erased their presence has been was systematically erased uh, and denied and and belittled and uh, you know it, they arose to to work against that erasure. Uh, you know, and and it was even damaging of white people's own history in terms of the 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 marble tablets that were locked away for twenty years, like as as though it was a, a toxic idea to show black and white fought together in the Civil War. So I I, I think it's really time now to kind of hear from them and and let's get a specific you know item specific recommendation in our in this report. Um, and I know that this falls under peoplehood, but Amherst as a town itself is, um, how do you call it, like siloed, like people are in their own little groups, but the Black community for is extremely in, in their own groups as well. And so bringing the, that could be the Black town meeting, but just ways to bring the Black community together as a whole again. And then I just remember like back in the, back in the day, which you know, everybody went to the New Africa house, right? Like, and everybody ate at Yvonne's at some point. And then everybody had stories, time with uh, 
issue at some point over at 1200 North Pleasant Street, the old Amherst Survival Center. I mean, like these are things like you didn't go to school with these people, but and you didn't necessarily know who they were, but they're people that you knew because they were part of that community. And we kind of lack that nowadays. And I understand that that goes under peoplehood, but I think there should be a strong element to bringing that community back. Absolutely. Absolutely. That. Okay. So that all, yeah, fits in together. And I did invite um, Anika to come to one of our upcoming meetings. And so maybe what we can do is have her come into our next meeting um, and, and hear from her if she's ready to, you know, talk about um, her thoughts in terms of recommendations that we would make. And so, all right, I am going to um, just check here. And um, I think if there, are there any other member reports or any anything else that folks would like to discuss before we we adjourn? All right. Well, thank you for your patience with me today and, um, and, and your love and support and uh, great meeting. And we'll, we'll see you at some point next week and, um, and have a wonderful weekend of Juneteenth festivities next weekend as well. All right. Meeting adjourned at 335. Thank you. Surrounding you in, um, yeah, you can go and stop the recording. <laughs> Just going to say.